Welcome to Breaking Banks. Welcome to Breaking Banks. When we started this show, we talked almost exclusively about the world of banking and how it was being transformed by fintechs. Now, over a decade into the fintech revolution, it is more than just changing lending and payment accounts that have been unbundled, rebundled, unbundled again, rebundled. No part of the financial world is untouched, from insurance to regulation, in person experiences, even fiat issued currency is under digital transformation. Today's show is focused on wealth management. In partnership with blueleaf.com, a platform that helps financial advisors manage their client engagement, we're launching a regular segment called The Augmented Advisor, that merging of human and digital interaction. In the first half of the show, Blue Leaf CEO John Prendergast and I talk with April Rudin about how customer needs are being changed by technology now more than ever. April is the founder of the Rudin Group and one of the most influential voices in wealth management. In the second half, I'm joined by Scott Lynn, a multi-time technology entrepreneur with a passion for collecting art. Ever the entrepreneur, he asked himself the question, why can't the average investor, you know, the type that doesn't have an extra couple million lying about, invest in art, real world class art like Monet, Warhol, Picasso, and thus Masterworks was born. Masterworks is an, an investing platform that allows anyone to purchase and trade shares in iconic artworks. As I mentioned, this show is being sponsored by Blue Leaf, sophisticated technology for wealth management without the complexity. Simplify your practice with Blue Leaf. Level up your firm with sophisticated client engagement, reporting, rebalancing and trading, billing and invoicing, and business intelligence simplified through their unique automation and design. Give your clients and your staff an experience they'll love while simplifying your processes and saving money. Learn more at blueleaf.com. Welcome, April, and thanks for co-hosting with me, John. We often think about evolution as slow and steady change, and the reality is environmental forcing functions often drive spurts of rapid change. And I think almost everyone would agree financial services and the world writ large is in a time of rapid change by some forcing functions, both an economic depression as well as a pandemic and travel bans in the world basically turned upside down now. April, one of the things that I've tracked for the 10 plus years we've known each other is you've tracked at a macro need how the, the customer's you know, habits and how they're looking to be spoken to has been evolving. I'd love to hear, you know, how do you think that this you know, long-term trend was evolving and then what happened with COVID to accelerate that? So thanks, Jason. I mean, that's a great question. Um, financial advisors, Although some of them are B2B, most of them are B2C. And, and most of them are, in fact, clients of financial advisors themselves. And I think in providing services and thinking about products, sometimes they lose sight of the fact that they're actually dealing with people. And sometimes I've heard people even call it a B2P, which is business to people business, which I thought was interesting. So when you switch it around and you try to have some empathy and you think about the people you're serving, I think that that really puts a new light and point of view on everything that you do. Um, Financial advisors could be very highly trained in portfolio construction, investment returns, um, tax mitigation sometimes, insurance, right? A whole host of um, items and their clients could be also very sophisticated uh, they could be entrepreneurs who've sold you know, successful businesses and so on, but they might not be educated in the same things that advisors are trained in. Um, and so I think it's also, you know, it's beholden upon advisors now to really consider and talk to each person in a really hyper-personalized way and think about where they're coming from and what their services are. Uh, I think for so many years, wealth management suffered from a one-size-fits-all type of approach, whether it was from, you know, the cookie cutter portfolios to talk tracks to, you know, whatever their offerings were, one website. 
And I think now everyone's realizing that um, wealth management has, has many different faces and is made up of a myriad of customers with different needs. Well, that myriad of customers in this idea of segmentation and myriad of needs is a really interesting one, right? Because we used to fit them in buckets based on asset size or investable asset size and kind of shoved them into those directions based on like the, probably the combination of age, you know, almost always began to equate to where you are into the investable asset size. How is, you know, that beginning to change now that we have richer insight than ever before, you know, a bunch of the startups that have gone after the wealth tech space are really starting to attack that. How is our understanding of the customer, him or herself beginning to change? That's one of my favorite areas because I think you're right. For a long time, people bucketed customers based on asset size, and then it had nothing to do with right their behaviors, their wants, or their needs. So that was really disparate, and that didn't work. And then along came client segmentation based on um, age. You know, millennials, all millennials want this, or all women want this. Yes, and, all, mil- you know, all millennials need digital. All they do is digital, and old people don't do digital. Exactly. So these segments really didn't work either um, because, you know, I I guess I don't have to go into the reasons, but I could, right? Um, You know, uh, uh, study after study has borne that, you know, uh, the the actual highest appetite for digital is among ultra high net worth baby boomers. And why? Because they have the most complex, right, assets. They're the ones who need digital, right? They're mobile usually not these times but mobile and global and so digital really plays into what they want for millennials i think that advisors saw that as being a big cohort of you know new aum and that's all true but i think the idea of bucketing them into one bucket really doesn't work i mean there are some things to consider for example uh you mentioned startups well 26 percent, something like that of millennials are entrepreneurs or will try a startup. So they could have greater assets than other segments. So April, you know, um, while segmenting on age doesn't work, uh, I'm curious about how various age groups interact with one another. I know you do, do a lot of work thinking about millennials and I'm curious, you know, what you see as the impact of the rise of millennials and, and this uh, awareness that the industry started to have about millennials, you know, what has that impacted in terms of the use of technology for older client groups? So um, let me break that down a couple of ways. So I would say that um, millennials millennials themselves haven't been satisfied with that sort of one size fits all or that cookie cutter approach. So if you take a look at what the impact of millennials has been, it's that they've disrupted that. So that's what I always tell people to just think about that. Um, And that's what's really disrupted all of wealth management and all of this sort of client segmentation is people realize that it's more important to segment on behaviors than it is to segment on age. So I think it's really important to think about that, you know, it's that moment in history and that moment in time that has really changed everything. And I think, you know, as important as thinking about how millennials have sort of changed those buckets is to think about how millennials or um, have impacted also financial advisors themselves. You know, we're in a recruiting crunch and um, as the average age of the advisor increases, you know, the average age of the advisor now is like 60 plus. So thinking about them serving new cohorts of clients has created some gaps and some opportunities for people. And that is what I find super interesting. And, you know, I think it's really interesting to think about segmenting based on behavior. And I'm curious, you know, what are some of the key behavioral segments that you think of when when you're thinking about that, when you're talking to your clients? Well, I think the key behavioral segments, you know, are, you know, just with digital, is it digital communications that people want? You know, what does digital really mean? Because digital itself can be broken down into so many components. So uh, I feel like that's all bucketed up also. Like we offer, quote unquote, digital wealth management, whatever that might mean. 
And as we were talking, you know, prior to the show in one of those really good nuggets, Jason, you know, we talked a little bit about how client communications digitally could be the most important type of communication that firms are missing, right? So it's not on the digital wealth management side, but it's more on the digital communi communication side. Like, do I know where my money is? Do I know where I'm invested? Do I know what my financial picture looks like? And do I have access to that 24 seven for questions or reporting or uh, anything that might relieve my anxiety, particularly in today's times? Now, my financial advisor friends always cringe when I say this, but no one wants to talk to their financial advisor until you actually need to talk to your financial advisor. And it rarely is driven on a quarterly basis. And I think one of the missed opportunities in a lot of the advisor space, and I think one of the things the best do well is they realize they're also part counselor because you know what is one of the most... Um, humanizing aspects of advising that you need, which is this empathy of, am I okay? You know, like that's the question, regardless of asset size. I'm like, am I on the plan? Because the computer can probably do a better plan than any advisor can, but it can't put its arm around your shoulder and say, hey, it's not going quite as well as you expected and we need to change this. Or no, like it feels like the world is turned upside down, but, you know, let's communicate not quarterly of, you know, me shoving a bunch of papers at you across the table. But to have that kind of communication, in some ways, I'd say the communication is more the product than the actual underlying returns. John proved me wrong, or April proved me wrong. <laughs> you know, I think um, I think our perspective certainly is that 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 communication is where uh, the rubber meets the road, right? It's it's where you demonstrate what you're delivering to clients, and um, and it's how you articulate something that April talks about a lot. Um, uh, which is how you offer something differentiated, right? It's the way you express that. So um, certainly communication is is key to what an advisor does day in and day out. Um, I think the interesting thing is uh, the way that I've heard April talk about the intersection of um, digital and communication and sort of how that personalizes. And I'm, I'm curious, April, you know, how you've, how you've been thinking about that intersection. So I think, you know, it's it to me, uh, the firms that do it best just offer many different entry points. In other words, you can have a phone conversation, you can have a Zoom call, you can have uh, a text message, you can have an email, you can have that bloody report, Jason, you can have whatever you want. I think what's wrong, uh, if you will, and what needs to be disrupted is the advisor or the advisory firm deciding what's best for the client. So I think having these multiple entry points allow people to choose the way they want to be served. And I think that's been the most remarkable um, change is really allowing that. And some of it, and you quote me on this, comes from just the term of advisor as if there's some hierarchy here. And this is what I was trying to get before, where the advisor so, is the be all, know all, end all person instead of a real partnership where they're on a level playing field. It's interesting you said that. It made me think of the way that advisors use the word practice to describe their business. Um, and how, as you said that, I thought of the doctor patient relationship, which is almost parent child in some ways. And, and you're talking about a real evolution of the power of the client relative to the advisor. I'm curious how your advisor clients are adapting to that. Uh, difficulty, right? So older advisors, more senior advisors, whatever we're going to call them, are used to this sort of advice, right? That people come to them, they tell them what to do, and they do that thing. And um, recently I remarked to someone, someone asked me about impact investing. And I said, impact investing should really be reimagined because the impact of impact investing to me is more about clients coming to their advisor and telling them what they want to be invested in rather than the advisor telling them, here's what you should be invested in. Well, and that's a whole nother level of personalization, you know, that I think for too often personalization first meant let's make sure uh, you, you know the risk profile matches you know in your portfolio matches what your goals are and you know what your investable assets look like relative to that 
And now we're talking about it's not just about matching investment style with you know that risk tolerance and goals, but really a level of personalization that says not just return, but what's important to you. Exactly. I mean, we've made a really, um, you know, quite a 180 from the days of uh, investment management, right, where you're measuring returns and choosing advisors based on their ability to give you returns. Whereas today, I think, you know, most clients are really interested and advisors are trying to pivot to more of a holistic financial plan and more goals-based investing, which of course is more personalized, right? It's considering, I mean, even though it sounds ridiculous, just considering what each person wants and what their goals are rather than taking a cookie cutter approach from the advisor. Here's what your your goals should be, right? Or everyone has the same goals, which is nearly, you know, higher returns. It doesn't take into consideration so many different things that happen over um, uh, life cycle. Yeah. In that idea of, you know, we're talking about values-based investing, not just, you know, impact. I think people view is like this narrow bucket that, that, that is either for the tree hugger crowd or the ultra wealthy, you know, they can afford to do impact investing, but there's this wide swath around what are the things that you value? Are there categories you don't want to invest in? Are there categories you do believe in, you know, that you want to overemphasize that the uh, advisor's role in delivering on that has gotten infinitely more complex as those needs have changed, as the marketplace is, is having those offerings, do you find that you know, how are advisors adapting to the, their world has just gotten so much more complex? Well, I think that that's the difficulty. That's what I was saying before: is switching from one of advisor, right, with the hierarchy where they're telling them what to do, to really having to consider. Uh, different investment types that either they may not agree with or know about, and that's put a lot of pressure on them to really know more or and do more than the than what they've been doing. Um, and if you couple that with the changes in advisor compensation, the way that they're paid and the way that they're billing clients, it's really created. All right, I'll say it: disruption to the advisor's world um, because that means everything's different. So they're not paid a percentage of AUM, they're not incentivized to really grow portfolios. So what is their job becomes a little bit squishier and it's not as formulaic. So I think to your point before we started recording, Jason, right, uh, financial advisory used to attract, right, a certain type of quantitative person who is really more interested in stock picking, right, and portfolio creation. And that's morphed over the years into a more empathetic right type of financial advisor that is guiding someone to meet their life goals and th that those skill sets are quite different so april it it sounds like this evolution of client needs has really really seriously impacted the role of an advisor it's it's changed quite dramatically from someone who essentially dictates clients behavior um, to, to someone who's now responsible to architect a series of safe choices that have to be okay for, for the client. I'm, I'm curious um, if, you know, there are ways in which you've advised your clients to think about that transition of role and how they're, how they're doing with that. It's quite complicated, really. It is. I mean, Really, from a messaging standpoint, we've worked with a lot of clients and banks, independent wealth managers, RIAs, and so on, broker-dealers, how to communicate that, you know, that openness and that willingness to really listen to what clients want and deliver solutions based on that, right? So I think it's more about um, creating more of an atmospheric brand and a feeling brand because money is so emotional. And I think that's where people have moved to rather than being more um, computational, if you will, right? And just looking at returns. So I think, uh, and I hope, right, that the newest advisors that are drawn into the field will be more of the empathetic type, more that can advise clients on, you know, a more holistic, outlook and um, help them through 
different life cycles uh, rather than just simply helping them make money and assuming that the returns will solve everything. Um, I think that, um, just to go back to the first question because I'm not sure I answered it, that Jason asked me about what has COVID done? I, I saw a meme recently that, that said, that asked, um, who's driven, um, maybe you guys have seen it, who's driven digital transformation at your organization? Is it the CTO, the CIO, or COVID-19? <laughs> I, I can tell you across the board that COVID-19 has taken everything that financial institutions hold is sacred that we can never X, Y, and Z. And the very next executive team meeting says, we need to go do X, Y, and Z immediately. We're going to the cloud and we're working from home and we're going to be yes. using chatbots, like all of it. We're doing it now. And somebody down yes. the road has to be saying, but you said we could never. It's like, that was then, this is now. Yeah, the five years and five weeks or, yeah, you guys have heard all of that too. So I would say that that's been a real silver lining for clients has been, and, and I guess for banks and financial services, just to know that they can do it. And it's been a stress test really like no other because we had to do it. Yeah, Churchill said never waste a good crisis, you know, to and so we're certainly not. And maybe we should have uh, as an industry aligned better with, the evolving customer needs uh, along the way. <laughs> now, I want to circle back to something you had said around this idea of, you know, the new advisor that's looking to grow, you know, their platform and their brand. The world has gotten noisier than ever, especially in a COVID world. And, you know, us as listeners have gotten, you know, more tired than ever in distracted and distraught in an ability to discern. How should an advisor begin to, to build that part of their brand? So I think it's really more about personal communications and um, personal relationships and finding common ground. Um, I don't think that was part of an advisor's purview just a few years ago, but even the way we started our call, where are you located? Who are the people we know in common, right? How do we really connect is, is really, of the utmost importance, especially for advisors. And that goes way beyond the two times a year or four times a year meetings that people are used to having. I mean, I've had advisors tell me that it's never been easier and never been better for them to get closer to clients on Zoom calls because you can see where someone's sitting, you can see their location, you get an idea of their lifestyle, right? It gives you talking points, it gives you some insights that you may not have found if you were sitting at your mahogany table in your office on the 19th floor of some office building somewhere. I hadn't thought about that because it's very rare that the client says, yes, come sit at my kitchen table and you know, see the mess, hear the chaos. Um, you don't always get into the, so you have young kids, but on Zoom, hey, I hear you have young kids and from the sound of it, a dog as well. Um, that ability to you know, build relationship in an efficient way. Are there downsides to this though? Are we lacking some of that personal, you know, connectivity and that I feel like this person knows me and feels responsible for me? I feel like Zoom and digital, if done in the right way, has increased it and has made people much closer than they've ever been before, where it's been easier to be distant. And I think People craving relationships and craving connection will be more open. Um, I guess the only negative thing I've heard is some advisors say, you know, they might be uh, embarrassed about their lavish setting, right, in their home. So they don't want their clients necessarily to see their pool and their setup, right, something like that. But other than that, I think it's just a real opportunity for people to get closer and get to know each other better. And that's what's been reported to me, and that's my experience. And April, I'm wondering if when you're talking to advisors, you're, you're hearing um, other points of view where advisors aren't so thrilled with the changes that have been forced with COVID. And if you think that there's any risk, at least for some advisors, of kind of a COVID snapback uh, you know, behavior that goes right back to sort of pre-COVID and they, they hunker down in that traditional view of the world. I'm curious if you're seeing any evidence of that. 
Uh, I think it's a great question and a great point. I mean, with the average age of the advisor being 60 plus, you know, I think some people it's been more difficult to do this pivot and they would much rather be back at their offices uh, in a white, you know, start shirt and a, and a navy blazer uh, because that's the way they're used to operating. And then perhaps they'd rather be at a fancy lunch Right. And they or they'd rather be on the golf course because that's been the way they are you accustomed to doing business. But I feel like, you know, we've come so far that it will be the clients who are dictating the way they want to be communicated with, as I mentioned before, instead of the advisor. So I think that shift is what's happened and it'll be difficult to go back to that. Fantastic. Well, I think that is a great place for us to wrap that, you know, this business was always about the client, but more than ever, the demands of the client, the way they need to be communicated to what they need to be communicated on the frequency, and even what their objectives are, this idea of values being the basis of the relationship is a really great place to end. So thank you, April, for taking time to talk about the evolving customer needs within wealth management. Thanks, April. Thank you, John and Jason. So imagine it's 1999. You're using Napster to pirate the latest Backstreet Boys hit. And I would like the record to show that Cassie is the one who inserted Backstreet Boys. That was not me at all uh, ripping Backstreet Boys. Well, you decided to kill some time while you're waiting for that to download. And you decide to you know click on that banner ad and punch the monkey for a little bit in the hopes that you know you might actually win 20 bucks. Well, our guest today is Scott Lynn, the old guard of internet advertisers, and he's the guy who actually invented that game. So, Scott, <laughs> I am so curious how you go from internet advertising into fintech and now fintech in the art world. So I want to start off, punch the monkey. What was the inspiration? Uh, that's a great question. I haven't, I haven't, nobody's, you know, haven't heard anyone talk about that in years. Um, you know that, so we, I, we created that game when I was in high school. I, I think I was um, 17 at the time. And, uh, you know, the idea was pretty simple back then. It was just, how do we, how do we build a website, buy a dollar in advertising, drive people to the website, which was this game where people kind of uh, tried to find money in a money tree, as, as it seems like you remember, and uh, get them clicking around and seeing more advertising. So we would make $2 in revenue for every dollar we spent. And it's funny, the, the big breakthrough in that business um, was this company called Flycast. I'm like going back 20 years in, in my memory. So I'm, you know, I'm a kid living at home, still with my mom uh, in my bedroom, 17 years old. And I build this, this game with a friend and we, we, we create this, this model where we spend a dollar and we make $2, right? So the, yeah. the challenge was how do we get as much money to spend as possible so we can scale this business? So it's, it's the dot-com boom at the time. And we go to this company called Flycast and I apply for credit. And it says like, how, you know, how much credit do you want to apply for? And I just put $450,000. <laughs> and, and as a 17 year old living in my mom's house during the dot-com boom, they gave us $450,000 in credit. So as two kids, we spent $450,000 and made $900,000 and we just kept, we just kept going. So that was, uh, that was my first company. Yeah. That is, were you shocked by the success? Which was more shocking, actually, the fact that they gave a 17-year-old $450,000 or the fact that it became such a big success? I mean, I, I think both. I mean, I, you know, you're, it was my first company, right? So I didn't, really, I didn't really know what success was. I mean, I was just, it, you know, I was making so many mistakes and that, that business grew so fast. I think, um, you know, I graduated high school. I think we had 40, 50, 60 employees, um, you know, it was just, it was a, to it was a totally surreal, surreal world. But, um, I, I even now, you know, I think, I think back today, like out of all the businesses I've started, like that was definitely the most fun. Well, uh, tell us more far. about the other businesses. So what can, how did you land in the world of FinTech after that? Yeah. So after, after that company, I started a bunch of different online advertising companies. Um, the most notable of which was this company called ad knowledge, um, you know, which we became kind of the largest online advertising network outside of Google, Yahoo, MSN at the time, um, five or 600 employees. And then I think I just got bored with online advertising. I think a lot of people who grew up in the online advertising space just, uh, just got burnt out on it and decided 
to move into fintech with this company called Payability, which which today has advanced a couple billion dollars to um, e-commerce sellers, so like Amazon okay. sellers. So we, we finance a lot of the e-commerce community. Um, and then after Payability, really really started Masterworks. And Masterworks was this culmination of, of starting tech companies for a long time, um, kind of being you know, a finance person, and then just also collecting art. So I, I started collecting art when I was 19 years old. Uh, my mom was like an amateur artist. I grew up with art books and, and collected it really back then as, as a passion, um, but then appreciated sort of the financial characteristics of the asset class. Uh, wound up today with with kind of a top 100 collection in the U.S. and um, have 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 always wanted to, I guess, make it more accessible to to everyone. Um, but there there hasn't really been a way for people to invest in it outside of having millions of dollars to buy these paintings. So Massworks is the first company to securitize a painting by selling shares in individual artworks. And today, you know, we have various offerings on the website where people are investing in these paintings and then. Recently, they're also trading trading shares in these great works of art. So I think it's a yeah, that is super interesting in terms of the move to get there. So how does it actually work? From like, how does one go about securitizing you know a, a piece of art? Yeah, so I think I think a lot of your listeners are, are blockchain people. So we when we first had the idea about Masterworks, we thought about this as a very simple um, approach to essentially tokenizing artworks. And, you know, this was, I don't know, three and a half years ago ish when there, there were, there were lots of debates about what is a security and what isn't a security. And we thought there was a good argument that this was not a security. And we actually got advice from, from two major law firms saying that they thought that these, these would not be securities. So we, we wanted to take multi-million dollar blue chip paintings and essentially put them on the blockchain and then, and then have people trade trade tokens and these different works of art. So that was version one of the platform we built out. I think like lots of companies, the the regulatory landscape either, you know, evolved or clarified depending on on what your interpretation is. And uh, you know, we we realized they were securities. So we we basically buy a painting, we put it into an SPV, we file it with the SEC as a qualified public offering through Reg A. We sell shares in the painting. Um, and then eventually people either sell their, their shares through the trading platform to get liquidity or we'd sell the painting down the road. So what actually happens to the painting physically at that moment? Well, that's a good question. That's, that's evolved. So we, when, we, when we first started Masterworks, obviously we didn't have that many paintings. So we have a gallery in Soho where people um, can come to the gallery and see the, see the works of art. Um, you know, today we're I think of 27 paintings now doing one painting every, every seven to 10 days. So growing, growing quickly. So we've just started a new program where we're actually lending out works of art to institutions or museums uh, around the world. So the, the vision really going forward is to have these paintings that people invest in beyond either temporary or permanent loan to museums. Wow. A, Normally, I'm not a huge fan of double-sided marketplaces, but I love, like, this is an interesting twist, right, where you've created a marketplace for people interested in investing in art, and on the other side, you've got this philanthropic share art with the world marketplace of putting on temporary or permanent loan, you know, at the backside in terms of what people are investing in. Yeah, and it's great for us because it's, it's effectively free marketing, right? So it's, it's good for investors, I think, good for museums, good for us. Yeah, it's good for everyone. So tell me a little bit more of the 27, you know, pieces. Are there some recognizable, are there any interesting stories that have come out of, um, you know, that's actually pretty substantial, you know, growth for a short period of time? Yeah, I mean, they're, they're all paintings. So generally, I tell people to think about um, investment grade artwork as paintings that, that probably in today's world begin at $500,000, maybe a million dollars, right? So it's very hard to buy a painting that isn't quote unquote speculative for less than that. So these are all, you know, a million dollar, uh, I think our most expensive painting is $7 million, so kind of one to $7 million paintings by artists like Basquiat, Warhol, Monet, uh, mid-career, uh, late-career artists like Kaz, um, Banksy, um, people like Cecily Brown, uh, Gunter Ford, um, you know, both, both uh, what I would consider kind of art, you know, art world artists as well as more pop culture names. So 
of those, you know, you know, we're talking, you know, well-known names, like you said, you know, the investment grade and what you get in, and you're actually going and doing the pur- purchasing. How do you manage, you know, that piece? Do you have the SPV pr- first? Like, are, is this almost the SPAC of the art world where you, you have the funds first and you go acquire? Or, you know, do people know what they're investing yeah. in as part of this up front? Yeah, so that was that was an intentional decision. So we, you know, it's interesting. So we did, when we started Masterworks, um, we did kind of a deep dive on history of art funds. And we, we really tried to understand, have, have there, has there ever been any art fund that's been successful? And the, and the short answer to that is no. You know, there's been a handful of art funds that have been created in the art market that raise capital from art world people. Um, but there, 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 there haven't been any that have been successful. And I think what that taught us is that when people are unfamiliar with an asset class, they're probably unwilling to back a manager Okay. So we so we we had this very deliberate strategy where we decided to buy paintings with balance sheet capital as identified assets that we bring to the platform, and people can pick or choose, knowing exactly what they're investing in. Um, uh, is kind of an initial way to get familiar with the asset class, and that that so far has proven very effective, right? Like we you know we're raising more capital now than any any art fund has ever raised historically. We're one of the top buyers in the art market, so I think I think that's that's working now. Over time, as as people start to trust the Masterworks brand, I think maybe we can build out other product offerings, like like fun products, for example, where where people trust us as the manager. Um, but at least initially, we we just thought that that would be too hard. Well, so who is the investor then, you know, coming in? Because you made a very curious statement around the people, you know, who don't trust the manager. Are you like taking someone who's interested in alternatives broadly? Is it someone who's interested in art, but, you know, can't afford, you know, that one to seven million to go own a piece of it? You know, what does that, you know, buyer look like for you? Yeah, there, so there's 90,000 investors on the platform today. Um, when we when we started the company, we thought that there would there would be this interesting product market fit where like people who you know can't afford million dollar paintings but are buying ten thousand dollar paintings would invest in these vehicles. I think what we found is that if you're if you self-identify as an art collector today, you're probably not interested in investing with Masterworks because you think you can just do it better yourself. It's kind of like you know, trying to sell a read to a real estate person, right? Like they, yeah. they just think they can do it better themselves. Or so going think, to a financial advisor and telling them, hey, you should, you know, be using a robo advisor ETFs, right? Right. Yeah. Good. Yeah. Same, same example. So, um, you know, what we've wound up with are really just self-directed investors that are looking for uncorrelated returns. Um, and we, we spend a lot of time and energy really training people on how to analyze uh, these assets, how to think about these investments, um, how to think about allocation of portfolio overall. Uh, we actually did the first correlation study on, on uh, between art and other asset classes with Citigroup in um, uh, the, I think the middle of 2019, like COVID time is time warping everything, but yes. <laughs> I think sometime it, a century <laughs> ago in the world of uh, PC pre COVID. Yeah. I think it's. Uh, I think we released that that first study in like mid twenty nineteen or beginning of twenty nineteen or something. Um, but anyway, yeah. So we, you know, we we have ninety thousand investors on the platform. The average investor is what I would describe as a mid sized investor, right? So we don't really have investors less than a thousand dollars. We don't really have investors more than a couple hundred thousand dollars. They're they're somewhere in the middle. Um, so it's it's this it's this interesting. Kind of mid-sized investor where there's there's nobody really big, there's nobody really small, but it's it's everywhere in between. Well, in I think that's an interesting aspect of this whole fintech play, right? This democratization. Because when would you ever see an art investor able to go, you know, really be an art investor other than you said speculative? Which I'm guessing how that works out is probably a little bit akin to buying lottery tickets. Um, yeah. You know, if you're trying to build a portfolio with a hundred thousand dollars. Yeah, I mean, here, so here's a shocking statistic in the art market. So if you look at the art market today, so last year roughly sixty-eight billion dollars in art sold. Um, the top one hundred artists out of out of that sixty-eight billion, so these are artists like Picasso, Basquiat, Monet, etc. The top one hundred artists are sixty-four percent of that volume. So if you just think about the probability of being successful as an artist, right, it's very, very, very small. 
Um, obviously, millions of people have tried it historically, and there's there's a hundred people, most of which are no longer living, that control the market. Yes, <laughs> don't normally think about the that the the non living master in terms of controlling the market. So when people come to the platform, you know, are they in the, you know, art curious phase of things? Are they coming because of that, you know, lack of correlation? You know, are they investor savvy looking to learn about a new asset class you know, that comes to it? Yeah, they're definitely, I mean, our investors are definitely investor savvy. Um, I, I don't think that's true of every online investing platform. You know, I think, I think we all have our different product market fits, but our investors are, are definitely, data-driven, you know, running the calculations on historical returns, thinking about standard deviation return, thinking about risk adjusted returns, like they're, you know, they're, they're, they're doing this to make money. So then you, I can only imagine what your trading platform has to look like given, you know, what they're used to seeing, you know, is this like the Bloomberg terminal of the art world? Well, you know, we, so I mentioned, you know, obviously we're uh, selling securities, so we're, we're regulated by lots of different government agencies. So that somewhat dictates how that, that trading platform operates. But um, yeah, I mean, we try to provide as much, as much functionality as we can for investors to, to trade shares with, within those frameworks. So I'm curious how the first meetings with regulators went down, because I'm assuming <laughs> art funds is not something FINRA sees every single day or the SEC. You know, what yeah. was their reaction when you come? In? Well, you know, it's it. I look. I think I think the SEC in general, um, compared to lots of government agencies, is is pretty competent, right? A lot of people go to the SEC as a stepping stone to private practice, and there's there's a lot of smart people that work there. And our you know our general counsel would would say that. I I think that they had never seen an investment vehicle like this. You know, we went we went on file. We got qualified for our first vehicle. Um, I think 15 months later. So definitely, definitely took a while. We're, we're now at a cadence uh, with the SEC to where, you know, we're getting offerings qualified in a matter of weeks. Yeah. So, it, so it's definitely different today. Um, but it took, it, took a, it took a long time to get here. And, and I think the thing, you know, to, to understand is these agencies aren't really built for businesses like Masterworks. I mean, at the end of the day, the SEC is a, it's a people driven agency, right? Like they're, mm-hmm. they're used to, to dealing with typical IPOs. They're not used to companies like Masterworks filing one IPO every week. Um, they don't really have an infrastructure built to, built to handle that. So I, you know, I do think the SEC probably has to evolve with, with how they, they manage companies like us as more and more companies start, you know, securitizing or tokenizing these, these, these different asset classes. So, you know, you've shown your breadth of entrepreneurial acumen. What other asset classes do you think are ripe for disruption? Other than, you know, like, as you look at art, you know, where do you say, hey, you know, this new application of technology, new application of financial structure, it's now open for that kind of disruption? Yeah, I mean, I, I think it depends what exactly you're disrupting, right? Because it, it, it depends on the asset class. Let me give an example. So if you, if you think about a company like Fundrise, who one of the, the founders of Fundrise is on our advisory board. Um, so, you know, I've heard about it a lot. But basically, Fundrise was the very first platform um, to allow retail investors to invest in, in real estate, right? Yep. So that, that's not necessarily disruptive because REITs have been around forever, and larger investors, you know, qualified purchasers or credit investors even, um, have had access to, to those different products. But uh, Fundrise was really one of the, the first companies to make that available to retail investors, right? So you can invest $500 in real estate. Um, so that was disruptive from a, from a retail investor perspective. I think the thing that we think is so interesting about Masterworks is that there's, <laughs> there's no product in the art market, right? Like you, you have this asset class, which... Deloitte estimates is $1.7 trillion in value. Sotheby's um, has kind of confirmed that. And there's nobody that's ever securitized it, which is just mind blowing to me, right? Like the art market, Sotheby's just recently went private on the New York Stock Exchange. I tell people that, um, you know, the company's 275 years old. They can't, they can't get their head around that. I mean, Sotheby's was the oldest company on the New York Stock Exchange. They've literally been selling art for almost three centuries. You know, in our world today, we just can't even wrap our head around that. But that's how the art market is. It's just, it's, it's, you know, it's operating the same way it has been for a very long time. Well, in, you know, when you think about what enables that kind of disruption again, right? So you've always had the buyers there, but because it couldn't be securitized, you know, like 
there was very little from you know putting my Michael Porter hat on, you know, like the bargaining power of you know was low there, and the same on the suppliers, right? You know, they were kind of locked in stasis, and there weren't really new entrants because there weren't new vehicles. I guess the new entrants were new artists, but that was you know all about a speculative. But there wasn't a new entrant into the platform because you're closer to Sotheby's, you know, than the painter. Yeah, I think I think the challenge, you know, when I when I pull myself, and it's funny you mentioned five forces. So five forces is that we've done that analysis. I've done that analysis for every business that I've run for 15, 20 years. Um, so I'm a big Michael Porter fan. But uh, you know, I think the challenge of the art market when you think about why there hasn't been that much innovation is if, when you when you pull yourself away from it and you look at it for you know decades or maybe even centuries you really have this very large market, which again, last year was $68 billion in sales, catering to a relatively small number of people, right? So whether that's 10,000 people worth $100 million or more, whether it's 25,000, whether it's 7,500, like I don't know the exact number, but it's a relatively small number. So how much innovation do you need to kind of connect those people between each other? Not a lot. So I think the thing that's different about Masterworks is we're actually taking this pool of capital, which are people that know nothing about art, and introducing them into art, and and really, you know, for the people that are that are savvy in the art world, I think that's what's what's interesting about our business. Now, how has the art world itself responded? Because you brought in a new level of competition. You, you are the new entrant in their world. Yeah, I don't. I don't. Uh, we are the new. We're definitely the new entrant. We're you know we're we're the hottest startup in the art market, if that means anything. <laughs> uh, but uh, how many other startups were you competing with for that title? Yeah, I mean, there's actually there's a lot of them. I don't know if there's that many great ones, but there's a lot of them. Um, but yeah, I mean, I I, I guess. I'm I'm not sure I'm not sure anything about that. Yeah. So, you know, wrapping this up is you think about where the future of Masterworks. What's next that you've you obviously built a robust market, you know, a great number of investors, you know, a good product in terms of what's going in. You mentioned this idea of, you know, there might be some new vehicles, you know, coming up. I'm sure there's more technology. What excites you about, you know, not just Masterworks but the ability, you know, technologically whether you know, it is the application of blockchain or the application of artificial intelligence, you know, where do you see this all going? Yeah, I mean, I guess I think about our business slightly differently in terms of, you know, very simply, the most exciting thing is how do we take this asset class, which is massive, you know, historically, at least if you look at the top 100 artists has outperformed the S&P, we've proven that it's uncorrelated and just help people allocate to it, right? So to me, it's less about building this self-directed investor platform and more about just securitizing an asset class that I think has a role in every portfolio. So today that's that's the platform. Um, I think next year we're, we're heavily focused on how do we add additional features, provide additional liquidity through the secondary market platform. Um, and then eventually how do we build products for the, you know, the non self-directed investor community? Like a lot of people don't realize this, but it's, it's interesting when you think about self-directed investing, it's, it's roughly 3% of total assets in the U.S. are self-directed, right? 97% are managed through intermediaries. So I think we, we realize that, that the self-directed community still on an absolute basis is huge, right? It's I yep. don't know, billions or trillions of dollars. It's still really big, but it's, it's a tiny, tiny, tiny fraction of all capital. So once we, once we prove product market fit through um, the self-directed platform, I think we're we're more focused on how do we build out other products for the managed money community. Well, I can't wait to see, you know, as one of my investment options in 401ks or, you know, on ETFs that they were going to find, you know, what's your allocation, you know, to the masters and what happens with masterclass. Now, have you actually gone out and looked to buy any famous paintings around monkeys? Because I think that is naturally, <laughs> you know, the, the final place yeah. that you need to go. You know, it's so, what's so funny is we actually just, um, well, we bought our second Banksy painting uh, and sold it off. I can't remember now, three, four months ago. And that, that painting was a uh, monkey sitting on a tree and someone in the office made that, made that same joke. So <laughs> we, we, we've already done it. <laughs> All the, you beat me to the punch. Um, no pun intended. So who does ultimately decide when to sell and to monetize on that? You know, you bring so we, up a... Yeah, so we decide. Um, it's totally at our discretion. Our, our very first offering, we had a shareholder vote construct. Um, and that was probably a carryover from, I guess, how we were thinking about voting in, in the blockchain world. 
Um, you know, the reality is we, we remove that after the first offering because of how the art market operates. It, it's, you know, when you, when you, you generally sell things in an event driven context. So, you know, you own a Banksy painting, there's a Banksy painting uh, literally coming up, I think next week at Christie's that could set a record. It could make ours more valuable. We want to be in a position to sell ours if that one yeah. sets the record and we just had to move fast. So I think, I think voting would make sense for some types of, of assets. I just think with art, um, it can, you know, it can be, it can be tricky. Oh, fantastic. And thanks for taking the time, Scott, you know, definitely one of the most interesting asset classes that we had on the show. So appreciate you sharing that. Thanks, Jason. If, if people want to learn more, where do they go to sign up for yeah, just go to www.masterworks.io, um, create an account, schedule a call with our membership teams, 15-minute call, and then we'll, we'll get you set up and, um, and investing. Thanks. That's it for this week. If you like the show, make sure to give us a five-star rating on your favorite podcast platform or share it with a friend or share it on social media. We'll see you again next week with more Breaking Banks.